Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 25th of September. I'm Robert Barwick. And I'm joined today by Citizens Party founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. In this week's Citizens Report, countdown to bail-in showdown and a Gestapo won't protect public health. So first, countdown to bail-in showdown. And Craig, we're blowing the uh, starters gun here. We're firing the starters gun on a two-month intense campaign to get Senator Malcolm Roberts' bill passed in Parliament on the 30th of November. Now, his bill is called the Banking Amendments Deposits Bill 2020, and this bill will put will remove all doubt whether bail in, whether deposits can be bailed in in Australia or not. Yeah, that's right, Robbie. Look, the thing about the Citizens Party is, for the last 32 years, we've always encouraged ordinary folk, people who think themselves as ordinary folk and they're not, to get involved in politics, yep. to go and make their Don't voice sit on the sidelines. Known. Not accept the mantra from the major public parties, major you know, political parties, leave it to us, we'll look after yeah. you. Look what they've done to us in the last 30 years. Yep. No, get involved. And this is an absolute prime example of where people can make a big difference in this next period. Absolutely. So what we're doing is we are um, ramping up the campaign now for a two-month burst, like I said, and we're doing it starting with an ad we've just produced for the internet, social, for sharing on social media, for getting around the internet, to pop up in, in uh, Google searches. Have a look at this ad. Your deposits in the bank are not safe. How do I know this? I'm Robert Barwick, Research Director of the Australian Citizens Party. Your bank deposits are not safe because banks over the past decades have engaged in increasingly speculative financial derivatives. The world got a taste of what could happen in the global financial crisis of 2008. Tragically, the government response to that crisis was to bail out the banksters who created the mess and the result is today's financial bubble is bigger than ever. Making matters worse, more and more people are now in trouble on their mortgages, threatening to pop the real estate bubble. In the next crisis though, the bailout of the banks will include confiscating people's deposits. It's called bail-in. It was done in Cyprus in 2013, and people lost 47.5% of their savings. How is this possible? Most people don't realise that when you put money in a bank, you are considered to be an unsecured creditor. How safe does that make you feel? In February 2018, the Australian government rammed through legislation giving APRA crisis resolution powers. This law specifies that only certain specific financial instruments can be bailed in, confiscated, under crisis conditions. Then it includes the phrase, or any other instruments. Could you drive a truck through that loophole? The Australian Citizens Party has been sounding the alarm. We're working with Senator Malcolm Roberts of the One Nation Party who introduced legislation that would close the loophole and protect depositors. Sign our petition and help us send a message. Hands off our deposits. No one should have to suffer the horror of seeing their life savings disappear. Corrupt bankers should not be bailed out on the backs of innocent depositors. Don't delay. Get involved. Sign our petition and share on social media. Let's not wait until the next crisis explodes and it's too late. So there you go. And you can, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see the link below where you can click and um, sign the petition yourself. And the main thing is share it. Share the ad, share, the, share the, uh, the petition link as widely as possible. We can do this for two months and I'll give you some more on that in a minute in terms of ideas on what to do, how to campaign on this. But just to, just to reiterate the point of this next two months and what Senator Malcolm Roberts' bill does, the government's position, or what they say, is that the, the, the bill that Malcolm Roberts is putting up is unnecessary because, it says, the law is clear. Um, but we've, yeah, we've, made a cartoon, us. we've made a cartoon over this. <laughs> Have a look at the cartoon. But in the report that the Senate inquiry um, produced to, to explain why, it's un, why the law is already clear, they took, it was a very long, convoluted, complex explanation of it right it's basically all these moving parts if you take this and take that and take this and take that and put it all together it means the law is clear and of course by definition that means the law is unclear they're explaining them to the public this is why you have to trust us this, this is why you have to trust them 
Whereas what Senator Roberts' bill will do is insert in the law what doesn't appear there right now anywhere, which is a, a, a line that says Australian bank deposits cannot be bailed in. Full stop. Mm -hmm. Right. And that cannot be um, misconstrued in any way. That's what we have to get through to these um, members of parliament. Now, in the other, the other thing the Senate inquiry said, though, Craig, which is on our side, is they, it, the, the inquiry found no adverse consequences to passing Senator Roberts' bill. So it won't do anything else except what we say it will do. Right? And so for the members of the Senate, when, the, when we're, you're talking to them in the next few months and, and they're thinking about how they're going to vote on this, they have to decide, are we going to stick with the government's line and keep the uncertainty there, which by definition is there, right? Um, that is not reassuring the public. Or why couldn't we just pass this law, remove the uncertainty beyond all doubt, and reassure the public? And it will have no, no knock-on effect in anywhere else. Why wouldn't you want to do that? There's only one reason you wouldn't want to do that, Craig. And that's because you do secretly plan to bail in deposits because you've signed on to the Financial Stability Board's yep. um, prescription the other for agenda. bailing in deposits. Yep. Exactly right. The other agenda. And look, it's very clear we've gone, we've been fighting this campaign, Robbie, now since 2013 when Cyprus was first bailed in. Yep. And people couldn't believe that could happen, that the government or the, and, and the banks would take people's deposits. But that's exactly what happened. And all the excuses, all the uh, manipulations and stuff that this committee has been doing and the government's been doing is proof that they have this intention to bail in people's deposits. And we've been the only institution for the last seven years that stood up and said, have a look, this is the policy, this is where it comes from, these are the international institutions that are pushing it, the Financial Stability Board. This is the, and the reason is not to protect people, but to protect the, the banks, banks first and foremost. All right, so here's what I want people to think about for the next two months. Um, what we need you to do, we've, put out, we've got information on our website that you, can, that you can follow as well and links to the members of parliament. You need to think in terms of calling your member of parliament and all the senators in your state. And once you've done then, feel free to call senators in other states. And you can get them from the links on the parliamentary website who these people are. Send them a link to the ad that you just saw. Um, and any other material you want to send it to them, but then follow it up. So send them an email with those links, then follow it up and say, did you get my email, right? Have you watched it? You've got, it's only two minutes, right? You've got to watch this. And then say, I insist, I want you to know, you've got to pass your Malcolm Roberts' bill, right? This clarifies everything. And if they say that they won't, demand to know why, right? Because the only reason not to is because they're harboring the, the desire to bail in deposits. Now, we have to keep that up, though. So when you do it, do it again um, in a, a few weeks later. When other material breaks, we'll, we'll make sure it happens that we report it on here, right? And in our publications, take that breaking material and send it, breaking news and send it to the members of parliament as well. So that we've got two months to do what we've successfully done with the cash ban law, right? Which is show the senators there's such a public, public um, opposition to this that it would be political suicide for them to, to um, not go in this direction. Right, and we can do that. So when we take a let's take a quick break because when we come back, I want to elaborate on a, a developments actually around the cash ban law, um, and which reinforces why it was right for us to oppose that, and the same reason why it's right for us to um, fight for this bail-in amendment bill. <laughs> Welcome back to the Citizens Report, where we're discussing countdown to bail-in showdown. And Craig, before the break, I referenced the comparison between the cash ban campaign and this bail-in campaign we're in. Um, there's interesting developments around relate to the uh, cash ban campaign that I just want to bring people up to speed on. Today, we've put out a release headline: "Money Laundering and Debanking Scandals Expose the Real Criminals, the Banks and Their Government Accomplices." Right, and this is. I mean, it's the cleaning up of this criminal apparatus, which is one of our main motivations for fighting on these fronts. And Robbie, right? the, real absence, that's what they are. the real absence of any control here is an actual publicly owned national bank. <laughs> and now we've been campaigning for this as well. Without actually a steadfast uh, you know, public bank yep. that's there for the interests and the benefit of growing the economy for the Australian people in their interests. A people's bank. Yep. A people's bank. There's no way you're going to control the private banks. No. And there's plenty of historical examples of how the Commonwealth Bank, before it was privatised in the 90s, 
in the war years stood as the, the bulwark against the profiteering potential of the private banks. And even just as a, as a public trading bank, um, it forces the private banks to compete with it and they've got to be, they, they have to lift their game, they've got to right. be more honest, etc. And, um, you know, there's so many reasons to bring it back. And that would solve a lot of these um, problems, but let's just go through some of the, the things that have happened. So this week, Westpac has just paid a record Australian fine of $1.3 billion for millions of breaches of anti-money laundering laws, right? Um, however, it was, I mean, it's way too small, but any, any bigger fine would have wiped Westpac out. But, it, but if the minimum amount for all its breaches um, was uh, imposed, then Westpac would, wouldn't exist, right? It's, a, it's, it's an 11, amount of money. $11 billion worth of breaches. Yeah, they, 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 couldn't, they, they could never have paid that. But this was a huge... Um, th th this was a, a huge breach of the law that Westpac did, right? Um, but it's taken in the in the authorities' stride. It, at the same time, this week there's a there's a massive leak of U.S. Treasury doc documents um, uh, called FinCEN documents, which reveal there's there's at least two trillion dollars in dirty money in the global banking system, Craig. Now yeah. the biggest offenders are the banks we love to talk about: J.P. Morgan, Deutsche Bank, Standard Chartered, HSBC, and Bank of New York Mellon. And I want to point. I want to highlight two of those: the two British ones, Standard Chartered and HSBC. Both of those banks are banks that are audited by KPMG. Now, KPMG is the global accounting firm that is behind the cash ban in Australia. And the cash ban was put up. The excuse was, "Oh, we've got to stop money laundering," right? And this KPMG represents the money laundering machine, right? They are, as as we say in the press release, they are the black economy. Um, one of the things is this. According to this leak, uh, these documents, they, they reckon there's at least 200 million in dirty money in Australian banks. Well, that's a gross understatement. Mm. 23 years ago, we did an interview with the federal police um, in Canberra, and they pointed out then that there was $7 billion in dirty money propping up the Australian banks, right? So it's much bigger now. Anyway, despite these money laundering scandals, is, what's the government doing? Are they actually proactively trying to, prop to, to clean up money laundering? No, they're going the other way. There's a law that they've proposed now, a rule change for the stock market, which will allow more money laundering because currently the stock, stock brokers cannot trade for clients who they haven't ID'd. They have to know their identity, right? They have to have done paperwork. They want to change the rule so that stock brokers can, play, can, can trade for clients without knowing their identity for up to five days giving the clients time to get in and get out of the market in big moves that can launder a lot of money in that time, right? This is, and the stockbrokers aren't the ones asking for this. The government's doing this. And it's very similar to what the government is doing with um, uh, already with real estate. Mm -hmm. One of the big scandals um, in Australia, Craig, is that with all this attention on money laundering, the, the real estate sector, everybody knows, is a huge launder of money. Huge. A lot of foreign money has come in to be laundered through the real estate sector. And it happens in the UK, it happens all around the world. It, that's what happens in the real estate sector. Yet this government, our, our Australian government, refuses to include real estate agents in the um, anti-money laundering disclosure laws, right? So that they have to disclose transactions over $10,000 like every other business does, right? This is, these people have, these are the people, remember, I, I want to emphasize, one of the reasons they come up with the cash ban was, oh, you were cracked, we've got to combat money laundering. They've got no interest in combating money laundering. But what they do want to do with things like the cash ban is grab control and more power for the banks, as, as um, the same with, with um, bail-in. And so the other thing our release today goes through is how banks are aggressively debanking businesses. And this, this debanking is really chilling, right? Because if you had a, the banks want a cashless society because then all transactions have to go through the banks all electronically done, no one can escape that, no one can escape. The banks will know everything you're doing, right? And that's what the banks want. And, and the fees that go with them. And the fees that go with it. And remember a few months ago, the banks actually boasted that in, in the context of the pandemic, they had achieved in um, a few months a goal that they had thought would take five years to achieve in terms of reducing the amount of cash use in society. That said, the Reserve Bank was having to pump out more cash than ever because Australians want cash and they were pulling it out of banks and hoarding it, right? So what banks have been doing is targeting businesses that provide, that are, are in a form of competition to them, right? Give an alternative to people outside of banks using cash. And these businesses include um, gold and silver bullion dealers, 
um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency traders, right, that sector, and um, Western Union style remittance companies, right? So, you know, the people like a lot of um, ethnic communities use them to transfer money to relatives overseas, etc. And there's lots of them and they're very efficient. The, the banks can do this as well, but the, these, these ones do it quicker, uh, etc. Um, all these businesses though, Craig, comply with Austrax disclosure rules. Remember, what, real estate agents aren't forced to comply. These businesses do comply, yet the banks are targeting them to debank. They won't do business with them, and, and none of the banks will. Once one bank debanks one of those businesses, they all debank it. That's not enough, though. They are, we've got a case, and we might do a show on this on our Citizens Insight program. Um, we know a, a person who's a director of a cash and transit business, perfectly legitimate, he, he gets money from the bank, supplies ATMs, etc. He also supplies cash to these remittance companies, He's now being pressured not by the bank not to do business with those companies. So the banks aren't happy with just debanking. They want to stop other people from doing business with those companies as well. And this is where, Robbie, the idea of a public bank, a government-owned yes. bank, steps in because that means the public bank doesn't have to be concerned about people taking money out of the... the, the because they're not, the public bank's not interested in and controlling... Be, and, Craig, it wouldn't be allowed market. to discriminate against customers. Exactly. And so, look, the, the issue here is, again, the power of the private banks dictating to you and me how we're going to handle our finances and our money. Yep. Whereas a public bank is there to serve the people, not the people serve the banks. A big difference in principle, but that's why we've been campaigning for a people's bank, a national bank, a government-owned bank that acts in the interest of the people. All of these policies, Robert, you're talking about the money laundering, the, uh, the cash ban, the, the bail-in, all of this can be con you know, controlled and dealt with by a publicly owned bank. Now, the, the final point I wanted to make, Craig, is that the government's gone very quiet on the cash ban, right? Um, and I, as, as we've said on the show a few times, um, for all intents and purposes, I think we can say we've defeated it. But we're, we're monitoring it very closely. We're not taking it for granted. Um, but the point is, they went, they, they've done that, they've, they've, they've backed away from it for only one reason, the massive public backlash they received, which we helped to lead, people like John Adams and Martin North and, and um, uh, other people, people in the Bitcoin community, uh, Nuggets News, etc. big campaign against that and it worked. And we have to do the same thing with the bail-in issue, mm -hmm. right, in the next two months and that can work as well. Right? And it just takes a huge amount of effort. So, you know, be prepared, sign up to the fight. Next two months, we can turn politics on its head on this issue. And if we get Malcolm Roberts' bill passed so that the law has changed in Australia that bail-ins cannot happen, that will be a shot heard around the world because a lot of other countries will, be, will take notice of that because they've all signed up to bail-in, right? And that's, that's very important. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about the public health crisis in Victoria and what and the overreach that's happening. Welcome back to the Citizens Report. Finally, a Gestapo won't protect public health. And Craig, what we're talking about is that the Victorian Premier Dan Andrews is there's um they're, they're renewing the emergency coronavirus pandemic powers, right, that were initially passed in April, but there's some new elements in this renew in this omnibus bill that renews them, um, which is actually quite disturbing because they're including powers to allow the government to appoint anyone as authorised officers who would then be empowered to detain anybody that they consider high risk if they believe they won't follow COVID restrictions, right? So, and, and detain them indefinitely. Now, so this is, um, any way you cut it, this is disturbing. Now we're not, let me, let, let's just qualify this though. We are not um, questioning the need for public health measures. That's not what this is about, right? Mm -hmm. But you do have to be very, very sharp on, on um, principles of civil liberties that we've fought for for a long time. And, and when you get a law like this, it's pretty clear that this is going over the top because this is what, um, is loosely called pre-crime, right? Because how would the person actually know? And the idea that's in, indefinite is crazy. Also a qualification though, don't get drawn into the Liberal Party's grandstanding on this because they got no moral standing either. They invented pre-crime in Australia in 2005 when John Howard legislated pre-crime detention powers um, in the name of fighting terrorism. And that seemed reasonable to him, like this obviously seems reasonable to 
dictator Dan, Dan Andrews, sorry Dan, <laughs> um, that seemed perfectly reasonable to the great Johnny Howard. But of course, we fought that then, just like we're fighting this now, for the same reason, right? Governments might think something's perfectly reasonable. Once you put that sort of law in place, um, you know, the, the scope for abuse is incredible. Um, and the thing with, just back to the John Howard ones, Craig, they were based on this very broad definition of terrorism, right? So um, it, it's, it's how the law, the, the, the scope for abusing the law was in the definition of terrorism, mm. right? And that, that's in power now. Now, the, the, the federal one for terrorism is a, is, has a limit of 14 days, though, but it can apply to people from the age of 16 and above, and Peter Dutton's now trying to change that age down to 14 and above, right? Whereas the Victorian one is indefinite, and that, that of course, does go um, much further. The experts, the legal experts across the board, right to left, have called this excessive, called this alarming. Um, Julian Burnside, you know, who's no... Uh, liberal uh, on the um, uh, he's on he's the head of Liberty Victoria the old Civil Liberties Union um, he's he calls us um, absolutely excessive etc but this kind of you know Gestapo um, Craig is you know this what you get the sense here though is the government's resorting to measures like this instead of doing what it should be doing which is properly investing in the healthcare infrastructure that of all forms, right? Hospitals, testing, fever screening, screening, contract tracing, regional health, aged care, et cetera, right? Those are the things that should be doing, not substituting that for these kind of you know, panicked emergency measures. And I think the stark example of how that works, Robbie, is if you have a look at the public aged care sector here in Victoria, which is a state-based operation, it's the largest actually in the country. Yep. And a lot of these, uh, these aged care facilities are actually in the rural areas, right? Because the point is, in the last 40 years, particularly under Howard, you've had the privatisation of, of aged, aged care. care, which has become an absolute cash cow. Which is, the, which is the vulnerable group. And yeah, you're right, it's a cash cow. Uh, there's a report in the Saturday paper a couple of weeks ago that the, the biggest operators of aged care in Australia, private aged care, are four times more profitable, Craig, than any other aged care operators in the world. Four times more profitable. It's absolutely a cash cow here. And their, their clients are all dying from this pandemic. And this is the policy direction that Jeff Kennett brought in under the Liberals in the 90s to privatise essential infrastructure. And it's not just hospitals and so forth, probably it's all forms of infrastructure as a tax on and a cash cow for all for, for, this, for, the, for, for the private interests that get, get their hands on this. The, the key thing with the, the, the uh, the public. Just, just before you go on, your point with the state one, though, the public state one. The, oh, not the federal one, no, this is a disaster. The area. public state one has higher standards, and as a consequence, they haven't had the outbreak crisis that these private ones have had. That's right, and the point is you had the nurse, nurse to patient ratio is much higher in the public system, under in the aged care public system. You know, you've got uh, the, the application of PPEs correctly. All sorts of things are done correctly because there's actually standards put into place, whereas in the private sector, under the federal private sector, it's all open to yep. make a buck. And, that, and therein lies, defines the problem. That's what's got to be addressed. It's going to take money to address it. You can't cheat on that no. by instead coming up with some kind of draconian Gestapo system to police people um, and think that, that, will, that will be a substitute for this kind of investment that's needed. Absolutely. I mean, that's the key. You can't shortcut the need for public safety, public infrastructure. If you try to make money out of it, People are going to get very angry and and die and die. <laughs> so I'm not. That's not laughing about that. But anyway, Craig, we're running out of time. Thanks for this week. Yeah, thanks, thanks for tuning in, viewers. See you next week for more.